I want to thank everybody for joining with us here today. I'm going to be joined by Dr. Hellerstedt of the State Department of Health Services, uh, Chief Nim Kidd, the uh, chief in charge of the Texas Division of Emergency Management. There are others working with us as we speak, but in order to maintain uh, proper separation, they are not joining us in person for this press conference. The first thing I want to do is to update you with regard to uh, certain numbers concerning uh, testing and, and testing outcomes. Uh, let me give you uh, several sources of data. Uh, according to the State Department of Health Services, uh, there are 334 uh, people who have tested positive for COVID-19 uh, uh, across 43 counties in the state of Texas. Uh, new counties with cases since yesterday include Comal and Nueces. There are now a total of six deaths, uh, and there are nearly uh, 8,700 people who have been tested in Texas. And I want to explain something, and that is uh, there are a lot of people who go online to find out current data about who has and who has not been tested, how many people have been tested, what are the outcomes, things like that. Know that the uh, State Department of Health Services has one standard uh, that is applied here in the state of Texas, and it's the standard based upon the actual confirmed number of people who have actually tested positive. It, I know a lot of people are going to the Johns Hopkins uh, location on the internet and they see some different numbers there. One reason for those different numbers, if you were to scroll down and check their sources of information, you would see uh, that it includes people uh, who may have tested positive, but uh, it is not confirmed for certain that they have yet tested positive. I will be probably including both sources uh, of those information in my numbers. So uh, according to the Johns Hopkins number, there have been a total of 566 people in the state of Texas tested positive for COVID-19, and those include presumed positive cases not yet confirmed. So confirmed received by the Department of State Health Services, 334 people have tested positive. If you add in the presumed as well as the people who had been at Lackland Air Force Base, it includes 566 people who have tested positive for COVID-19. Regardless of which of the two sources you may look at, both will indicate there have been six confirmed deaths. I want to give you some information about the level of increase. I know one thing that you know, people have been looking for is information about how much testing is taking place. Are we seeing more testing take place? The answer is yes, uh, there is a rapid increase in the number of tests uh, that are being uh, taken. Let me give you some quick examples. If, uh, uh, if you look two days ago, on uh, March 21st, there had been, uh, I'm sorry, let's go back to the March the 20th. So on, on Friday, March the 20th, there had been uh, 200, I mean, 2,335 people who, who had been tested. As of the next day, yesterday, uh, there had been, that number was tripled uh, for more than 6,400 people who had been tested. As of early this morning, uh, the number of total people who have been tested is now up to 8,700. Now, one uh, interesting math uh, about this is that less than 10% of the people being tested are testing positive. Bottom line is that uh, there is uh, a, a rapid increase in the number of people who have been tested and are being tested. Uh, there are new facilities that have been open in just the past few days, especially in all of the large urban areas uh, where there are new drive-through testing facilities as well as other facilities where people can get tested. You can continue to expect an increase number of the people who are tested as well as an increase in the number of people who test positive. This is exactly uh, what is to be expected. This is exactly what we are seeking to achieve. Uh, the the, the uh, testing capabilities will continue to increase. However, I want to emphasize one point that I'll make now and I'm going to come back to and expand upon further uh, in a moment. 
we are testing to the full extent of testing capabilities at this time. The reason for the increase in testing capabilities is because we have received more testing capabilities from the federal government. The inability to test has nothing to do with regard to lack of resources, at least monetary resources. We have all the monetary resources that we need in order to administer all the tests that we would be capable of administering. The problem is lack of availability of those testing resources. And this is a same concern faced by all governors across the United States about inadequate supplies of the needed testing resources. The federal government is aware of both our demand as well as the inadequate supply, and they are working aggressively to ramp up the supplies that they are providing. And as they continue to ramp up those supplies, Texas will continue to increase the number of people who are being tested. Uh, one thing that we are focused on uh, very keenly today in today's press announcement uh, concerns maximizing uh, both health care as well as hospital capacity. We want to maximize the capacity for hospital beds, for staffing capacity, for supply capacity, for uh, uh, what's called personal protection equipment or PPE capacity. We're working on all of those things. To increase the number of available nurses, I have waived regulations to address potential sh shortages of nurses. This will allow temporary permit extensions to practice for graduate nurses and graduate vocational nurse nurses who have yet to take the nursing licensing exam. It will allow nurses with inactive licenses or retired nurses to reactivate their licenses. It allows students in their final year of nursing school to meet their clinical objectives by exceeding the 50% limit on simulated experiences. And it fast tracks permits for out of state medical professionals. Another focus is to maximize capacity for COVID-19 patients at hospitals. This includes bed capacity and staffing capacity. And so today, I'm issuing two executive orders to expand those capacities. First, I'm directing all licensed healthcare professionals and all licensed healthcare facilities to postpone all surgeries and procedures that are not medically necessary to correct a serious medical condition or to, pre to preserve the life of a patient. Second, I am suspending certain regulations to increase the capacity of hospital rooms that are available. What this means is that hospitals will be able to treat more than one patient in a patient room, thus increasing their ability to care for the growing potential number of COVID-19 patients. Together, these orders will free up countless hospital beds across the entire state of Texas to be able to, to treat the potential increase in COVID-19 patients. Let me give you just one example. Some hospitals have indicated that through these procedures, they might be able to allocate 50, that's five zero percent of their beds for COVID-19 patients. In addition to these executive orders, to accelerate and exhaust all potential supply sources, I'm announcing a strike force that's focused on global supplies of all resources needed to immediately respond to COVID-19. Now, as I mentioned earlier, all states are experiencing this very same challenge. We don't have enough personal protection equipment. We don't have enough testing and collection equipment. We have the money for it, but the supplies are not available for us to be able to purchase. We are asking the federal government to accelerate production and supply of personal protection equipment and COVID testing equipment. The financial challenges they are grappling with in Washington, D.C. to try to address the economic consequences of COVID-19 can be solved quicker the sooner they provide states with the supplies that we need 
to address the health care concerns uh, that are uh, rattling the United States. To get this strike force going, I am announcing new members uh, who will be working with our staff to accelerate our ability on a global basis to be able to access the supplies we need. They include me naming Keith Myers, who before now uh, was serving as the Senior Vice President of Worldwide Procurement at Dell Technologies to serve in a similar role for us. He is taking a, an unpaid leave of absence from Dell to work for us temporarily to, to ensure that we're going to have all the supplies that we need. Keith will be joined by Dr. John Zerwas, an immediate past member of the Texas Legislature, who will assist with uh, organizing hospitals as, as well as other health care facilities across the state of Texas to provide additional beds and uh, additional staff that are needed to staff those beds. He will be assisted by Clint Harp, uh, immediately past uh, Vice President of Transmission Strategic Services with the Lower Colorado River Authority, who will assist uh, with asset research and procurement across the globe. They will collaborate with the, the public and private sectors to ensure healthcare facilities have the supplies and resources they need to respond to COVID-19. They will also work with the federal government and businesses to secure necessary per personal protection equipment, as well as everyday supplies, such as food, food for medical personnel, uh, food for first responders, and for those who have contracted COVID-19. In addition to them, I'm also naming Elaine Mendoza, the current chair of the Texas A&M Board of Regents, to create more inventory for daycare facilities to assist the daycare needs of our healthcare workers. A couple of comments about some other areas that have been uh, raised recently. First, the status of the executive order that it issued less than 48 hours ago. Uh, there, uh, uh, for the most part, I'm seeing good, aggressive compliance with that executive order. Obviously, we're still in the early stages of that executive order. Uh, I expect full compliance with that executive order. Knowing this, there are penalties for failure to comply with that executive order. Those penalties include uh, fines of up to $1,000, potential jail time of 180 days, and potential mandatory quarantine orders from either uh, the governor's office or uh, from Dr. Hellerstedt, who issued uh, a, a uh, health care emergency order himself. Uh, there have been questions raised uh, about whether or not Texas as a state must immediately go into a shelter-in-place status. And that request or that issue has been raised less than 48 hours after the implementation of my most recent executive order. We need to do several things. First, uh, we need to see the level of effectiveness of the executive order. Uh, second, understand this, uh, and that is uh, I am governor of 254 counties in the state of Texas. More than 200 of those counties in the state of Texas still have zero cases of people testing positive for COVID-19. The reality is, I know, as the public knows, that is, cases of COVID-19 are increasing in places like Dallas, in Houston, in Austin, in several other urban areas. What may be right for places like the large urban areas may not be right at this particular point in time for the more than 200 counties that have zero cases of COVID-19. As a result, my suggestion is this. As local officials fully understand, local officials have the authority to implement more strict standards than what I, ha as governor, have ordered here in the state of Texas. They already have the full authority at the local level to implement those stricter standards. And if they choose to do so, uh, I would applaud them for doing so. But at this time, it is not the appropriate approach to mandate that same strict standard across every area of the state, especially at a time when we are yet to see the results coming out of my most recent executive order. That said, uh, as I've said before, 
I will always remain flexible and on a moment's notice uh, be able to take whatever strategies are needed at a statewide level to ensure that we're doing all we can to combat the expansion of COVID-19. In the meantime, one of the most important things we can all do, we need everyone in the state of Texas to know and to understand the executive order that I've already issued. Do not gather in groups of more than 10. All bars uh, and restaurants are closed. We strongly urge you uh, to patronize your local restaurants through takeout or through delivery or whatever source you can uh, so that we can continue that as a very important food supply source. But let me say this also as it concerns the locals. I know that through either these drive-through facilities or through the, the need in certain locations, like I'll mention Dallas and Houston in particular, there may be a need sometime soon to add additional hospital capacity. I say first, what they need to do is to follow the direction of the executive orders that I've issued today that will immediately free up bed space to make sure that your bed inventory uh, is increased. Second, I had conversations with these hospital CEOs just a few days ago, and we talked about first and second tier strategies that can be used to provide more hospital spaces. That is exactly what Dr. Zerwas is working on along with Keith Myers to make sure that we have those capabilities. We will this week be standing up additional hospital medical provided healthcare facilities in the event that they are going to be needed to respond to an increased number of patients who test positive for COVID-19. Along those lines, I have previously activated the National Guard. The National Guard this week is going to be deployed to help local hospitals and local health care authorities respond to these challenges. I will provide the National Guard for the needs that they express. I'll give you some examples that I've heard. One is uh, there are now drive-through testing facilities in the large urban areas where the local authorities could use some help in the, the, either the pre-clearing or the guidance or initial screening of the vehicles that come to those drive-through locations. If you need the guard for that, I will assign guard to assist you in that. Also, the National Guard will be involved in the process of standing up these additional health care facilities of whatever type. They could be medical tents, which is what the hospital CEOs told me was their first choice. They could be you know, reinstating recently vacated either hospital or medical facilities, uh, get them ready for immediate use. So there are multiple strategies like that that we will be prepared to stand up during the course of the coming week to ensure that all of the health care needs, uh, all of the medical bed needs will be met in every community that has demands for them. Uh, with that, uh, I want to allow an opportunity for Dr. Hellerstedt to make a few comments, and then after that, Nim Kidd make a few comments, and then we will take some questions. Very good. I'm John Hellerstedt. I'm the Commissioner for the Texas Department of State Health Services. Thank you, Governor, for allowing me to participate. Uh, as you can see, the Governor has announced a very comprehensive plan that has many aspects to it. One of the aspects is to improve testing capacity. The other is to uh, ensure that we have a surge capacity, if you will, in terms of inpatient care. Those are very important. I really want to emphasize the need for continuing our preventive measures. So the things that were in the uh, uh, governor's disaster declaration, the, the uh, items that are in the public health disaster declaration and in the governor's uh, executive order really all speak to things that we are doing as Texans uh, together to prevent the spread of COVID-19. It is very clear based on the data that we have that we are in the early stages of community spread of COVID-19 in certain communities in Texas. And so now is the time we have the opportunity if we do what we've been asked to do together as Texans, we can have the opportunity to dramatically decrease the spread of COVID-19 in our state. That is what we need to do. That is the primary objective is that, is that preventive uh, actions that we need to all take. I'm very encouraged by the fact that people are eager to do exactly that. 
people understand that this is a critical period of time where we have the opportunity to greatly lessen the impact of COVID-19 on our communities. You can see it when you go outside. You can see it everywhere, and uh, that is a very positive sign. So let's make sure that we do the things that we're being asked to do that will uh, enable us uh, to defeat COVID-19. And then Chief Demkit. Thank you, Governor. As we've said before, while this virus's attack on the human population is new, the way that we respond to it is not. Including the addition of these private sector partners into our organization, this is not the first time we've ever done this. The governor has charged us with bringing all of the state's capabilities together, not just the public, but the private resources as well. I want to thank again the first responders and the healthcare workers that are out there responding to day-to-day -day emergencies amidst this new threat. And I want to urge us to be prepared and not panic. We need to quit the panic buy and slow that down and, and let the governor's orders take effect. We will keep you briefed, and I promise you we will get through this together. Let me take a few questions. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave that to Dr. Hellerstedt. The, the, the question is, uh, when do we believe uh, will be the peak of coronavirus spread in the state of Texas? Yes, we looked at several models, and, and the peak depends completely on our ability to prevent the spread. So exactly what we're trying to do is uh, not have the spread take place in the way it has in areas where really essentially preventive measures social distancing, hygiene, sanitation, and the things that we've talked about, and the other measures that the governor has outlined. We, it, there, we, we know what the spread is like when those types of measures are not in place. It is a very fast, very steep rise, and that is the thing we want to prevent. So what we want to have happen, what we know is the best thing to have happen, is we slow it down so that the peak comes later and lower and that peak, we don't know if we're successful. That peak may be some weeks or even months away. Uh, so uh, whether or not schools resume this year uh, d depends upon whether or not there is any reduction uh, in the spread of COVID-19. It's impossible to tell right now because uh, our stricter standards are just now going into effect. Uh, it will require at least several weeks of observation uh, to see whether or not there may be some containment of the spread of COVID-19. If there is, uh, there is a possibility for them opening. Uh, if, there, if there's not, uh, Mike Morath, uh, the Commissioner of uh, Education in the state of Texas, is working on flexible strategies. It may mean uh, that if they're able to go back in school in May, they could be in, in May and June. It, it may be that other strategies have to take place, but know this. And that is the expectation that Mike Morath has set out, Commissioner Morath has set out, uh, is that educators are, are working with parents and students uh, on other strategies for education. Where it's available, which is not everywhere, but where it's available, uh, students have uh, access to online learning. Where it's not available, there is the expectation uh, that teachers will be delivering uh, to homes uh, packets for students for homework purposes and for testing purposes. It'll be an aggregation of factors uh, that weigh into the decision uh, about whether or not stricter standards are needed. One thing that we're looking for, candidly, is compliance with the current standard. Uh, if, if we see strict compliance with the current standard, that means that the current standard is working well. And basically, if people are at home trying to figure out, well, what does the current standard mean? If you don't have an essential reason, to be leaving your home, you should not be leaving your home. It's pretty much that simple. And uh, if, if people can abide by that standard, that will improve our mitigation of COVID-19. If they refuse to do that, if we see non-compliance, if we see uh, activities that, uh, that promote uh, further spread of COVID-19, then stricter standards will be needed. The, the only thing that matters right now is public health and safety. And so we're looking at what is in the best interest statewide for public health and safety. Understand this, and, and that is um, I'm governor not of Dallas. I'm governor not of Houston. Uh, I am governor of those locations, but I'm also governor of all 254 counties. 
And so when it comes to statewide standards, uh, I'm looking at what is in the best interest uh, for people around the state of Texas. Well, there are several strategies that we're working on to ensure that we will have adequate bed supply as, as well as personnel supply to respond to COVID-19. Through two of these strategies, uh, it will automatically free up beds across the entire state of Texas. Uh, one is to eliminate what could be categorized as elective or non-essential surgery procedures. Uh, two is uh, for the rooms in hospitals where this is possible, uh, as opposed to having one bed in a room, that will have two beds in a room. Uh, through those strategies, as I mentioned, there, there's one uh, hospital that's a sizable hospital in the state of Texas uh, that said that they may be able to free up as much as 50% of their beds. And so, but that will vary from hospital to hospital. Uh, but we believe that those strategies will go a long way to free up beds. And then there are the other strategies. And again, I'm just rep telling you what the CEOs of the hospitals told me. Uh, their first choice of other strategies uh, would be medical tents that are already available that come fully equipped and fully capable of being able to treat people immediately. And then their second request was to stand up health care facilities, whether they be emergent facilities or hospitals or uh, health care offices uh, and, uh, that have been recently vacated uh, and turn them into, into fully operational health care facilities. And then there are second and third tier strategies uh, that we'll be working on after that, such as you've heard me talk about hotel rooms and motel rooms and things like that that could be available for people who have a mild condition of COVID-19 and just need a place where they can isolate. There's another category of procedures that are not elective, like uh, injectomies, something along that are removable, uh, kidney stones, um, moving. Well, it w w listen, we are, we are looking at that as well as all strategies uh, where, because it has been done in some states where there are emergency or necessary medical procedures that must be taken place. And we're looking at alternative locations for them to take place. Um, as it stands right now, uh, we're leaving it to uh, the, the physician's discretion about where they want to do it. But it, as you pointed out, the examples that you gave, those are the types of examples where the medical procedure is going to be needed. One more guess. You mentioned you being too collaborative at your level and concerned about the availability of PPE right now. Right. What's your take of that? Can I get you to repeat the question? Uh, PPE, can you just elaborate on your level of concern about the supply of that? Sure. Listen, well, the, of that? Uh, Texas, like every state. So to put this in context, I communicate with all the governors. All the governors have conferences uh, once or twice a week. Uh, definitely conferences that we have with the president. And so I know exactly what the other governors are saying to the president. Uh, and we are all have the need for the same thing. We all need more PPE or personal protection equipment. Uh, the, the people who will be doing the uh, specimen collection for COVID-19, they need to be wearing that equipment. Uh, other people who encounter anybody who may have COVID-19, they need that equipment. Our capability of responding uh, to the growth of COVID-19 in the state of Texas is going to be limited if we do not have more PPE. That, that's why uh, I am strongly urging our federal partners uh, to step up the production and acquisition capabilities that they have in a way far superior to the states. Uh, we've tried strategies and uh, there's uh, delivery dates in July. That's not going to work. We need delivery dates tomorrow, the next day. And we have ready money to pay for, for anybody who can sell PPE to us, uh, we'll cut you a check on the spot.